Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and I'm going to talk to you about NVIDIA's next GPU architecture. Despite Ampere being on store shelves, kind of on store shelves, for literally just a few months now, we're already hearing rumours of what is next for NVIDIA, and it seems to be Lovelace, which is based on TSMC's 5NM process. Lovelace, and please tell me you're uh, not getting scary mental images of uh, Jensen right now, because I would hate to be doing that to you. Uh, Lovelace is also different in that it's a monolithic die compared to what we're hearing about with Hopper. Hopper is said to be two GPU dies along with an ARM uh, CPU core, which I believe it was Matthew over at uh, Adore TV who first leaked that, so I'm crediting him, but I might be incorrect. So if I am incorrect, please let me know in the comments. Um, and this matches up very well with what I've been hearing more recently, uh, that ARM are going to be an integral part with NVIDIA uh, going forward because they also want to craft uh, x86 competitors as well, which is something I've discussed kind of a few times before. So I'll link those videos in the description if you've missed them. Lovelace, which I'm going to call RTX 40, although of course it's not officially named yet, um, it's said to not launch next year, but it's going to be the year afterwards. So you should be okay to purchase an RTX 3080 Ti or whatever and be safe in the knowledge that it's not going to be old hat in a couple of months. But this particular GPU architecture seems to be some type of evolution of Ampere. Now, Copity7 Kimmy uh, leaked this on Twitter and I was also talking to him a little bit in DM and it matches what I'm hearing as well that it seems some type of evolution of Ampere, but I honestly don't know what the architectural differences are. We know, for example, that they've doubled the number of CUDA cores per SM, and you know that is a really impressive way to improve performance for like prosumer work. And what I'm about to say is speculation on my part, but there are definitely many ways NVIDIA could move forward with Lovelace or RTX 40, a very simple idea would be to increase the amount of cash on the chip, a little bit like we've seen with perhaps AMD and RDNA 2. Now, whether it would be an infinity cache type of setup or would, whether it would just be, say, a larger L2 block or something like that, who knows? Other obvious candidates would be higher clock frequencies, a larger number of SMs, and possibly even improvements to the amount of work that each ray tracing core can also perform as well. I'm looking forward to seeing naturally what NVIDIA does here, and it would also be interesting to see who has the package advantage, um, because naturally RDNA 3, the rumor has it, at least the latest that I've been hearing, is that it will be on an MCM die. I'm also hearing that RDNA 3 is going to have drastically improved geometry performance. And you could imagine that ray tracing is also going to be something that AMD will be doubling down on for RDNA 3. Currently, we're about Turing level, so we can probably imagine that they're going to double, for example, uh, the performance for the next generation RDNA. I don't think that that's an unreasonable assumption for them to double it and maybe also change the way that ray tracing uh, functions on the GPU a little bit. I don't think they're going to completely redesign that for RDNA 3 because I think scalability is an inherent core goal with RDNA, and this would also naturally track with what we're seeing with um, uh, APUs as well, where they're uh, heavily investing in uh, APUs across the board for lower power consumption devices, laptops, and even desktops as well. Next up, RTX 3080 Ti, as well as various mobile RTX 30 GPUs have been spotted on ADA64. This is a smaller thing because it seems to be based on the um, device ID list which recently leaked. The RTX 3080 Ti, to my knowledge, still has exactly the same specifications as what we have seen uh, leaked by Copity7 Kimi previously. So that's 10,496 CUDA cores. That is of course, identical to the amount that the RTX 3090 has. The difference between the two, naturally, is the amount of memory, as well as the bus width, as we're seeing just 20 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory. It's going to be interesting to see how NVIDIA decides to market the 3080 Ti and the 3090, given they are very similar in terms of specification. I can see that either the two are going to coexist, or we might see the RTX 3090 be retired and maybe a different SKU eventually will come to the market, which will be, you know, the new Titan card or maybe NVIDIA will just change the way that it's marketing the RTX 3090. 
I think most consumers and prosumers even will probably rather get the 3080 Ti. Uh, who knows? Maybe they will do something in the drivers to try and differentiate the two SKUs. But for now, anyway, the two uh, offerings look very similar to one another. There may be some slight differences in like clock frequency, and perhaps the 3090 will be slightly ahead um, in some applications because obviously we have additional memory bandwidth thanks to the wider bus. <laughs> but um, yeah, I personally would rather pocket the extra like 500 bucks or whatever, as the rumor is that it's going to cost around 999 US dollars, maybe a little bit more, but. Either way, I would much rather pocket the cash. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm maybe I'm crazy. Also, real quick, I want to mention the RTX 30 mobile GPUs, as there has actually been a leaked V-Ray benchmark, courtesy of videocards.com, by the way, for this. You can see on screen yourself that there's not a whole lot to say about this. Basically, the RTX 30 series basically doubles the performance compared to the RTX 20 mobile series, at least in V-Ray, which will be fantastic for people who do prosumer work or, you know, 3D modeling or whatever. Um, this is a pretty damn big speed up. I'm hearing that uh, RTX 30 for mobile is definitely a really nice uh, set of chips. I personally have less interest in mobile GPUs. I know that uh, they are very popular, but eh, personally, I would prefer to work on a large desktop. But with that said, you know, my preference is on everyone's, and I do know that uh, for people traveling or maybe putting together presentations or that type of thing, these are very popular. And I also imagine they're going to kind of kick ass for gaming too. The last thing I want to tackle in this video is the PlayStation 5, as there has actually been a teardown by iFixit, so I'll link their article in the video description. It's pretty comprehensive, honestly. The purpose of the teardown is to actually find out the repairability of the system, um, and obviously what their conclusions are that uh, while you can certainly tweak, for example, I don't know, the, the fan if that goes or whatever, in reality, there are a lot of parts in the PlayStation 5, just like the Xbox or any modern console, that you can't do a whole lot about. So, for example, if the SSD falls over on the system, then uh, you're not really able to do too much about it, uh, unless you can, like, you know, steal one from another PlayStation 5, and you uh, yeah, that's a whole thing. But bottom line is, there are some interesting discoveries that have been, uh, well, discovered. I kind of painted myself into a corner with that. And let's jump in. By the way, just as a warning, um, this system is essentially butchered afterwards, so if you're squeamish about expensive electronics being, well, not worth as much as they used to be, uh, you might want to look away. But what they have done is break down the board, uh, uh, more ways than one actually, and uh, also kind of provide details as to what they've found inside. So the main chip is being uh, outlined in red there, and it's called Sony Interactive AMD CXD 960GG, uh, that rolls off the tongue, eight core thread processor, of course, with an interactive, with an integrated uh, GPU. And there is also Sony's own uh, SSD controller. I said, and I quote, it appears that Sony have a custom SSD controller to handle the PS5's crazy SSD speeds, while the Xbox Series X chooses a more con uh, conventional one. We've discussed the SSD on both consoles about a trillion times now, and of course the way that the uh, lanes for the PS5 are uh, integrated into the SSD. So uh, next up, there is also 512 megabytes of DDR4 memory. The part number is H5AN4G8NBJR. Dash UHC, and again, that's a DDR4 memory, 512 megabytes. If you've watched my more recent video, you'll know that that memory is basically for OS caching. That's what I was told by a couple of different people at this point. So essentially, that's for OS caching and OS functionality mostly, and of course, uh, SSD caching as well. It's not something the developers get to play around with. This is not like saying the PlayStation 5 has like 16. Point five gigabytes of uh, me of memory or anything like that. This is basically, uh, well, yeah, it's just caching for the um, for the SSD itself. So it's nothing, to my knowledge, that the developer either has to touch, it's not something they have to optimize for. This is all handled by the OS of the PS5. 
There's also flash memory, which I'm not even gonna read out that part number because I'll be here until tomorrow. And finally, there's also, of course, the 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, which has been created by Micron. And we can also see various other chips on this system as well, including a flash memory controller, which is made by Winbond, a HDMI redriver, uh, though they're not so certain about that one, and an I.O. controller, again, made by Sony, and Texas Instruments have contributed a USB power switch, and a plethora of other chips are also on the board, which I'm not going to go into because they're things like USB-C, bi-directional, and I'm sure you can agree that that's nothing exactly exciting. But I will also mention that the console utilizes a 16-phase uh, PWM um, design. I think I've mentioned that before in a teardown, but I might be mistaken on that, so don't hold me to it. And there are also, um, it's a pretty, honestly, it's a pretty um, impressive uh, design for the PlayStation 5. My only criticism uh, for it is that I do feel like the memory for these early production systems could possibly be called better. It is technically within JDX spec. The APU itself uh, is running pretty damn cool from what tests I've seen but the memory is not running as cool as I would like. I haven't tested it myself, honestly, because I don't have the uh, gear here to do the tests, and uh, yeah, it just is what it is. But uh, to my knowledge, anyway, the PS5, um, I do think will evolve. They'll probably change the design. There's also that rumor that next year we'll see some type of redesign for the PlayStation 5. I still think that's a bit early. I'm personally betting it's gonna be like 2022, the reason I think that 2022 is more likely is because I think at that point they will also shift to a different manufacturing process for the for the SOC just in an effort to reduce the cost and, you know, the actual heat output and all of those things. This is not a leak. This is just a guess on my part, but um, I imagine that that would be a good way for them to go. Um, I'm still 50-50 on the next generation consoles getting pro variants. I've been hearing whispers that uh, both Microsoft and Sony have already been testing this and have been kind of figuring out what they're going to be doing. But honestly, that's kind of obvious anyway because, well, they do that. Like Cerny, I think it was. I think it was Cerny from the uh, Sony team commented and said that the moment that the PlayStation 3 was created, they started to ask developers and were kind of like knocking on the door like, hi there, I'm Mark Cerny, can you tell me what sucks and what's great about our console? And so of course that's how the PS4 design was created. And then they did exactly the same thing to create the PS4 Pro. And then obviously the PS4 Pro design, uh, along with some PS5, uh, PS3 elements, funnily enough, obviously made their way into the PS5 with the uh, drastic programmability that we've seen on, for example, the geometry engine being, to my, uh, what I've been told anyway by a couple of developers, is actually their first party studios, that is Sony's first party studios, that um, were actually the inspiration for that because of uh, lack of control over culling, for example, of primitives and the, um, the geometry pipeline of the PlayStation uh, 5. But anyway, guys, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, then consider, of course, becoming a sub to the channel. And if you already have sub, definitely click the bell icon because you know how useless YouTube is with notifications. And uh, yeah, tomorrow will be a really fun video, um, which I think a lot of you will enjoy if you're into PC technology. So definitely get subscribed if you're new to the channel and you want to check that out. But uh, I'm going to let you all go. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.